The race for CB1 of the 2024 NFL draft class is a lot closer than everyone thinks. Is it a two-man race, or is there another name that we should throw in the mix? We're going to tell you next on the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Draft, your daily podcast covering the NFL Draft. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Locked On family? Let's get locked in. Welcome back to the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast, your daily podcast covering your favorite draft prospects. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your boy, Damian Parson, always on the ones and twos. You can find and follow me on Twitter at DP underscore NFL. I'm a national scout over with the Draft Network, as well as the host of the Locked On Clemson Football Podcast. As always, guys, thank y'all for making Locked On NFL Draft your first listen today, every single day. Thank y'all for being our family, but as always, our every single dayers, man. And I can't do anything championship related without my guy, the man with the ring and the title, Mr. LSU, Keith Sanchez. You can find him on Twitter at the Talent Code. Keith, talk to him, baby. What's up, Locked On family? This is Keith Sanchez, senior draft analyst with the Draft Network, man, in 2019 national champ with those LSU fighting Tigers. Yes, 2019, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, man. But you know why I'm here, right? You know, myself, Damian Parsons, while we're here, we're here to bring you that championship level content surrounding the NFL draft 24 7, 365. Anything draft related, you know, come to your guys, right? Myself. Damian Parsons and we're deep DP we're deep into the scouting notebook man we have two positions left we have cornerbacks and we have safeties we decided to go with cornerbacks for today's show like we said we're unveiling introducing the everydayers you guys our family our everydayers our listeners to this 2024 draft class from our perspective, right? And a lot of these guys, they're they're sophomores entering their junior year, right? So a lot of we're, we're just getting eyes on these guys for the first time, but being able to have a conversation about this. And like we've been doing with a lot of this scouting notebook, right? Starting off with the very top, right? Who is cornerback one? And I'm going to pass this question to DP because I, I, I told him pre-show that we may pivot this conversation because this – this is a rather inter- interesting conversation for me. I think the interior defensive line, the running back, and then now the cornerback, the who is CB, who is position one, right? It's kind of up for grabs. So, DP, I want to have this conversation. In your opinion, who is cornerback one? Man, the first off, I, I have to make this statement. The race for CB1 is a three-man race for me because in my region, you know, I initially watched Denzel Burke, who I gave a first-round grade to. And then last night when I was going through tape study, I watched Kool-Aid McKinstry, the top cornerback over at Alabama. And then I watched Kalen King in depth from Penn State. And for me, those are the three names that if you want to put three, like the top guys in a bucket and say, hey, the crown to CB1 is whoever's going to win this race, it's those three names for me. I have – Kalen King is graded a little bit lower than the other two. But those, but Kool Aid and and uh, Denzel Burke are, I would say, neck and neck in 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 in, in this race in terms of where I graded them. Like their grades are almost identical. So and, and, and so, is is it a true CB one? I don't think so. Okay, no, I'm 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 I, I'm glad you said that because that's how I felt, right? But I think this is where we differ. I have Kalen King up there. I have Kalen King up, and I have to be honest. I'm not sure about Denzel Burke. That that's Ooh. the one that I have the question mark about DP. Um, we're going going into this year, and it's in in. How do I want to put this right? There there's some technical things that I, I worry about, yeah. right? I I thought in press coverage watching him, um, there, there, he, he just technique, right? Like his technician as far as what hand to shoot, you know what I'm saying? Open up his hips, um, trying to you know use both hands. I, I thought that at times he he looked unrefined and he I don't want to use the word loss I, I don't want to use that yeah. word but you know just sometimes you can get lazy with your technique and and it allowed him to always be in the trail position and as a corner sometimes you can jump into trail right like like that's where you want to be I thought he was just always trailing you know what I'm saying and then he was always playing catch up and then that's when you seen multiple times right I like locating the football right and I always talk about panic or patience with cornerbacks right and you seen 
receivers go get the ball over him, right? Like, like there were multiple times where receivers went and got the ball over him. So I think this, if you just look at him, you know, movement wise and things like that, him and Kool-Aid McKinstry are very similar as far as I think height, weight, athleticism, fluidness of the hips. Like they check the same boxes, right? Like there's in a weird way, they're almost the same player. But I think in a weird way, they almost have the same concerns too, right? Because there were yeah. some times that I, I wanted Kool-Aid to play a little bit stronger, but I did think he was more consistent in his press man coverage. So I have that conversation and then the Kalen King conversation, right? 5'11", what, 195, 200 pounds. DP, I like Kalen. Like, I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm in on him, man. I, I, I seen the short area burst. I seen the short area quickness. I seen the explosiveness, um, ability to track the football, right? He's a guy that actually gets his hand on a football. He can locate the football and come down with it. Now, did he says have some of the same issues as far as consistency and press? Yeah, but I thought he was competitive. Like I, I like there was something about and go back to the panic versus patience. I seen patience with him, right? And I watched him, and this is the the effect of greatness because I watched the game with Marvin Harrison Jr. And that was when I thought he kind of got sped up too much, right? Like he, yeah. it was like every play he was trying to, you know how they say like you can't win the game on one play. I thought he was trying to win the game off on locking Marvin Harrison Jr. down. That one time, you know what I'm saying? Like just striving too much for perfection. And I thought he was oversetting in his press, right? Like he was like, you know, Marvin Harrison to give a move. He was too aggressive if Marvin Harrison went outside and he overset outside, right? And then gave yeah. him the inside or vice versa. So I I, I like Kalen King, man. I, I, I agree with you as a three-man race. If I had to rank him right now, I would probably go, I would go Kool-Aid McKinstry one and then I'm going Kalen King two and then Denzel Burke three. I'm I'm not even mad at you for that because I agree for everything you said was factual because I saw the same thing. I think I put it in my report at thedraftnetwork.com when I did the report on Denzel Burks is that he's technically unrefined and like he gets into that trail position then he doesn't locate the football. Yeah, it's, it's me, weird and it's like because you you believe that he has the speed right. Like when you watch yeah. me, like I, I feel like you a good athlete. Mm -hmm. But you're always in the trail technique. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's like, I don't know if you're jumping in the trail, right? Because for, you know, for some of our listeners, that's what the cornerbacks will do sometimes, right? Like they, they will play that technique to, to where they can play those underneath routes easier. But when a quarterback is throwing the ball over your head, right? And you're still giving up 30 up, then it's like, we need to switch it up. We need to do something <laughs> different. So it's just finding the source of that problem. Like, okay, why are you yeah. always in the trail? And then now locating a football, how do you go about that? And I think I think it goes back to that technical refinement, just not having the the wherewithal and the the savviness in press coverage to know, like you said, shoot which hand to shoot, right? How you know are you kick stepping, kick sliding? Yep. Are you immediately flipping your hips and opening the gate and just forcing a guy in one direction, right? Are you lining up pre snap to take away something like my shout out to my boy Eric Crocker, who's one of the hosts over at the Locked On 49ers, man. Croc always talked about when I worked when I worked with him. He always talked about what, from a cornerback standpoint, you take away something to chase something. So mm -hmm. it's like you know, as a DB, I always look for that, Keith. When I'm watching guys pre-snap, are you squared up? You know, giving them a two-way go? Or are you are you shaded inside? Are you shaded outside? I think Denzel Burke, from a mental, just a football IQ standpoint, has to like learn, figure that part out where he's comfortable and, and, and become more of a. I don't, I'm not saying that he doesn't study and stuff, but more of a, like that mental savant, that true student of the game where it's like he's watching tape, he knows what receivers do well, things like that. So put himself in the best position possible because he is athletic. He has the height and the arm length to battle at the catch point and stay within phase. And the crazy thing about it, even though he's in he, – because he is in trail a good, a good bit because of his lack of technical refinement, I think he plays – I always look to see how when, when you when you're – I, when you're in phase and when you're out of phase, how like how do you handle it, right? And I feel like he plays well out of phase too, just he doesn't – like because he's out of phase, he's sometimes chasing. He doesn't look for the ball because he's just trying to get back uh -huh. yeah. and get back hip to hip. So I'm with you. It's a three-man race, ladies and gentlemen. Me and Keith, we, 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 we've decided. It. It's stamped and approved by the locked NFL draft analysts that it is a three-man race for CB1. Do we have – them kind of moved around in the rankings, sure, but that doesn't really matter. Fact is, it's a three man race, and like you said, Kalen King and Keith, I'm gonna throw one name out there to you. 
he reminds me a little bit of Denzel Ward. Like, I see a little bit of Denzel, the, the quick foot, the athleticism, the explosiveness, the ability to change direction, stop and start. And that was something with, with Kool-Aid that I saw that was kind of a little bit of an issue for me was that he is tall, he is high hip. I watched the first game I turned on was him versus Malik Neighbors, him versus LSU. Mm -hmm. He was targeted like eight times. He gave a three catch for 27 yards. Those two dudes battled, right? But Malik Neighbors was giving him some issues with his ability to stop and start, press vertically, stop on the dime, come back to the football on curl routes and stop routes. And you see kind of – I'm not going to lie to you. There was some rep. Remember the, the, the Keely Ringo clips of him yeah. going yeah. one direction and then stopping this like he's got to take a couple extra steps to come to a halt to come back downhill? I saw that same thing with Cooley and McKinstry. So I, it's, it's going to be an interesting 2023 college football season to see where these guys – will actually land. But I think right now, unless there's somebody, I mean, which we got some guys that we're going to talk about in a little bit, but these are the top three guys for me. Yeah, well, DP, you already hinted at it, right? And, and that's what I want to get into. And that's why I, I knew that this was going to be a good conversation, right? And like I said, pre-show, this thing may go off the rails. I don't even know if we're going to follow the show script, right? Because we still have more cornerbacks to reveal. And then I have a big question for you at the end, right? Um, At the end of this 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 uh, this uh show. So let's let's right. get into the, our next segment, man. We're talking tier two corners, but also just potential guys that can threaten for CB1. Because right now, based off of 2022 film, right, we've identified the top three guys. Guys. But are there more guys out there that you can throw into this race that'll that'll be right there come week three, week four of the college football season? So coming up next, man, let's get into these tier two cornerbacks, these challengers, um, people that have the height, weight, athleticism measurements that just have to put it together for one year on film that can be that CB one. Our partners at eBay Motors have team, teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Football host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. Whether you're prepping for a draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So with draft prep underway for the up-and-coming season, let's see who Vinny has picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. Looking to make a smooth turn in fantasy football snake drafts with the last pick in the first round and the first pick in the second round, you will be guaranteed to have a winning one-two punch in your backfield when taking Jonathan Taylor and Nick Chubb back-to-back. -back. While Taylor is a perfect rebound candidate in a run-friendly offense in Indianapolis, Chubb is also set up to dominate with more of the workload in Cleveland. Vinny Iyer from Locked On Fantasy Football is going to help you win your championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. With eBay guaranteed fitting over 122 million parts and accessories for your vehicle right at your fingertips, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Air filters, brakes, batteries, alternators, taillights, shocks, struts, you name it ebay motors has it and they'll make sure it's the right fit for your car because ebay guaranteed fit helps you understand exactly what your what part you you need for your vehicle the very first time so go forth switch the gears crank up the ac and say goodbye to sweating if your ride needs a little fixing up because now you know you will always be set up for success from the get-go with ebay guaranteed fit Everything your vehicle is calling for is just a click away. For the parts and accessories that fit your vehicle, just look for the green check. Get the right price, the right parts, the right fit at ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guarantee fit, only available to U.S. customers. Tier 2 cornerbacks, Keith. And, and, and there's a guy, and, and the, the discussion around him is going to be, for me, is can he live on the outside? And that is, Jav I think it's Javon Bullard from Georgia. He played over 500 of his snaps in the, in the nickel last year. Granted, it, it, in, the, in the question that you typically ask when you see that is, why? Why did you play so many snaps in the slot? Well, you, you had Keely Ringo, who was a, you know, a, a what, three, four round, uh, you know, draft pick. And he was their outside corner. And then you had Kamari Lassiter. Who's like six one? Who's the tall? Both of those guys are taller than Javon, and he was at the other outside corner. But when I watched Javon Bullard, man, I saw a guy with high football instincts. Uh, you know, his football IQ is really good. You know, like I said, playing primarily in the slot, but he feels like there's a patience and a level of confidence to be able to read and and, and adjust to the receivers' movements and route stems 
while playing with so much space, right? He could play squared up, and it doesn't really bother him that you have a two-way go because he plays a lot of kind of off coverage, smooth back pedal, being able to stay uh, low to the ground and then drive. And there's some plays where you see him click and close, drive on the football, and not only drive on the football to either make a tackle, but a lot of times be able to create a few uh, of the handful of PBUs he had. So that's my main question for him and what will help his draft stock is now that Keely Ringo is gone, right? It's Kamari Lasseter who's still there. But can you take that the other outside spot, and can you live out there and play at a high foot high high level of football? And if so, uh, that's going to help his draft stock. But I also want to see more ball production from him. Only five PBUs last year, and only two interceptions, and he he was targeted about sixty times. You want to see him get his hands on a few more of those passes, whether it's PBUs. Heck, Sauce Gardner doesn't intercept the ball a lot. We talked about him. He doesn't intercept the ball a lot, but he had a lot of pass breakups, you know, when he was targeted as a rookie in the NFL last year. So Javon Bullard, 5'11", I think 180, 190, somewhere in there, talented cover corner. I just want to see if he can live outside. Yeah, okay, so that's your guy. My guy is going to be, and I talked about height, weight, right, some athleticism, um, that combination of speed. I'm going to go with Florida's Jason Marshall, um, a guy that, that that came on the scene, former five-star uh, guy, right, came onto the scene, University of Florida. And I, I believe that he started to emerge. And there was a lot of wrong things with Florida last year, right, both offensively and especially defensively. But when you watch this guy and being 200-plus pounds, right, you see the movement skills. And then I think about, you know, these bigger corners and how they're able to use their body and their frame to challenge against these bigger wide receivers. So I think he has a chance because even with Kool-Aid, right, Kool-Aid and uh, Denzel Burke, you get the feeling that they're 180 pounds, right? You know what I'm saying? And then when you watch Jason Marshall, it's like this guy's filled out. He looks a true 200. So I'm, I'm very interested to see – you know, just what he does this year, because it like, I mean, he's at University of Florida. So you're talking about legacy and, and then you're talking about getting coached by, I will say the best DB coach in the entire nation, um, coach Corey Raymond. And I say it and I mean it, um, you know, like the technique, right. We talked about playing press and how you had, I know he's going to work on that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that that's going to be a thing. So it's just a matter of he has some of the things there. Now let's see what he does as far as, you know, pulling it out of him. And he's if he's able to get better um, year two in this situation and year two getting this this style of coaching. But, DP, there's two guys um, down in Auburn that you had last mm-hmm. year that's sitting there that didn't come out. They returned back to school. I want to ask you, do any of these guys have that type of skills? Because this is a weird cornerback class. I just want to ask you. Do any of those two guys have what it takes to move up into that CB one range? I, I think I think Nehemiah Pritchard can. I, 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 he's built similar in terms of like you know height, arm length to Emmanuel Forbes. Um, I think he, he's heavier though. Emmanuel played at one like one seventy. He he he, he weighed in at one sixty six at the combine. Nehemiah plays at around one eighty, one eighty two. So he's a he's a little bit uh, filled more filled in terms of his body type, but a guy that could play ver- coverage versatility, right? Like when I think when we talked about uh, when we did the the cornerback discussion about like the be- best corners over the past decade, we talked about man versus press, and we both said we want a predominantly press man corner that can play some zone, and I think Nehemiah Pritchard can do that. He's a student of the game, high football IQ. Uh, I feel like he's technically sound. Where you know we talked about Denzel Burke earlier, not being that, not really knowing how to you know use his footwork in in in, in uh, the contact window, shooting the right hands and not locking his hip and stuff like that. I feel like Nehemiah does a good job of that. To where not only can he stay hip to hip and stay in phase, but if if it's a route that's going vertical, he understands how to stay on top of it. But I feel like that even for a six one corner, I feel like he got enough oil in the hips to be able to drop, sink, and drive and transition. With uh with, with those wide receivers, man, he was battle tested, of course. You know, playing in the SEC, seen a lot of high level uh wide receivers, especially athletically. And and then this young man, he's got the arm length, he has all the all the stuff. DJ James to me is more of a, a zone corner or off man corner, where he tr- he triggers downhill, he can click and cl- he can kind of close and drive on, on on shorter underneath routes. But I think you get the best out of him because I think for the difference between those two, I felt like Nehemiah was a better athlete. You know what I mean? On, on like functional athleticism on the yeah. on the tape. 
I felt like he, he ran faster. He didn't get beat over the top a lot. And, and he played closer to the line of scrimmage. As to a DJ James, he played a lot more off. So then that kind of gave me, okay, are you – are you or are the coaches worried about your deep speed to put you in press against these athletic SEC receivers? Could you get beat over the top? If, if it's if it's a situation where the, the receiver's even, is he leaving you, right? Like, if that's the case, then, yeah, you play him at off coverage. But these are two talented guys and two literally one of the best duos at the cornerback position in college football. And I, and I think that they're going to really be able to, given that another year, be able to shine in, in this system. Yeah, I was actually watching SEC Media Days yesterday, um, and Derek Mason was talking about, you know, those guys and, you know, saying like with, you know, with head coach Hugh Freeze, Auburn, they should be able to turn some things around. So that's why I wanted to highlight and spotlight those guys because we have our guy, man, who got drafted by the Titans. I'm, his name is slipping me. Um, oh, Roger McCreary. Roger McCreary. They came out of nowhere, right? Like he 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 emerged later on, but you've seen some really good reps with him versus John Mechie and Jameson Williams, and that kind of you know stamped what he can do as a cornerback and got him. Did he get drafted in the first round or second round? I know it was definitely second, I mean, top, like top, top two rounds. Yeah, top of the second. Okay, but DP, let's keep this thing going, man. I know you have sleeper cornerbacks on there, but I have a question for you that I'm going to ask you. So, man, y'all stay tuned. Coming up next, I have a question for DP, man. Coming up in the next segment. Family, it is time to wake up. That alarm clock's going off, and they we're talking about these cornerbacks, the guys that you need to blanket them high-level wide receivers at the next level. Keith, you said you had a question for me. What's the question? All right, then we listen. For those who have been listening to us, right, we know that DP has been – you know, he's been beating up on the 2023 class a little bit, right? He's been saying that 2024 is better than 2023. Uh, how you say 2024 is greater, right? Greater than 2023. So we've watched this the top portion of this um, this cornerback class. And, I, I, you know, there were some thoughts, right? And obviously we compare 2024, 2023, 2022. Of the past two, three classes, where is this 2024 class rounding out for you just off the initial evaluation mm, that's oof. that's tough man um I, I like of course i think 2022 that's the sauce gardner stingley class i think of course that class is top that's that's a, that's at the top i don't think that's a, a, a discussion right now um ooh. i'm i'm gonna say 2023 over 2024 right now. Okay. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the, the the high amount of guys that we talked about leading them to, to this past draft class with 6'2", 34-inch arms, good athletes, guys that can match up with so many different type of receivers, like the body types, the athleticism and everything, the coverage skills, coverage versatility. I feel like that class um, was better, man. Keely Ringo fell to the fourth round, man. You know yeah, what I'm, I'm saying? A, like, I'm read, yeah, I'm gonna read some names. You're talking Devin because I know we, you know, we go, we rolled through so many names and evaluations, right? Just to, you know, and, and not only for you, but for our listeners too, right? We're talking about coming off a year of just Devin Witherspoon, Christian Gonzalez, Joey Porter, Emmanuel Forbes, Keely Ringo, Deontay Banks, Cam Smith, Julius Brents, DJ Turner, right? Garrett Williams. So that was just. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody watching on YouTube, I'm throwing up that two three, baby. Two three, man. That, yeah, because that, that, that class is good. I had to ask you that, DP, because while I was watching, I had the same. I, I had I was wondering, right? And I'm like, okay, maybe this just is my perspective. So I was like, let me go ask my co-host, right? The 2024 over 2023 guy. I was like, let's have this conversation about which one is better, right? Like what what class, especially initially and some of those names I, I read off with a lady merging. No, but like, yes, but Christian Gonzalez, we knew about, you know, Garrett Williams, you know, some of those, those guys we knew about. And I just think that it's, it's a better class. And even to having this conversation, I, I'll be honest, DP, we, we, we talk about classes and that every class is not created equal, right? That's something that we always talk about. So a first round of this year is not a first round of last year. And so you have to plug these guys in and you ask me, where would a, you know, some of these guys like a Denzel Burke go 
in last year's class or where would he go in in 2022 and i could for sure say in 2022 he he may be my cornerback six right and that's this is based off of his sophomore film so i think this is this is going to make for an interesting conversation because how many of these guys are going to be given first round grades you know based off of the class and and, and their cornerback class versus how many of them are first rounders compared to the other classes that have been in the past no that, that's a good point man i mean because I thought about it myself. That's what's so funny. When you said you had the question, I was like, I bet money Keith is going to ask me. It's 2024 greater than 2023. And I can't, I can't say that, man. That 2023 class was just really good. And so 2023 over 2024. But I would say this, Keith, like just looking at this, this group and, and some of the guys that when we're talking about sleepers, Wake Forest has a guy. And we, you know what I mean? Kalen Carson, like this kid, I think he played, he was a two or three sport athlete. I think he played football, basketball, and ran track in, in, in high school. Plays a lot more off, off covers, like off man and zone. But you see, uh, you know, good knee bend, good hip fluidity, be able to turn and transition, uh, click and close to come downhill and, and, and play, <clears throat> you know, and play underneath routes. But I think he has the athleticism to, to run with, with, with a lot of different guys, man, in terms of straight line speed. They just don't play him at the line of scrimmage a lot. I would like to see more up close man to man coverage to see, all right, how how clean are you in terms of your uh, handling release packages? And, you know, are you an uber aggressive guy where if a dude's giving you a lot of foot fire and head fakes, are you throwing wild punches and getting, you know, countered? And now you're getting stacked. So, uh, you know, he, he battled, I think, some injuries last year, but he was definitely a guy that when I watched, I said, okay. Cause somebody brought him up to me and I was like, okay, I, I see what you're seeing. Um, you know, the, 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 the groundwork is there. The foundation is there. Now he just needs to build out the full house in 2023 uh, before declaring for the NFL draft where we can really get a full picture of what, of what it looks like, you know, for what he has built. But come on, I brought up early Kamari Lassiter, uh, the six one, you know, uh, I think he's like 190 uh, outside corner for Georgia. I kind of like Javon Bullock better in terms of just co coverage skills a little bit. But so with, with Javon, DP, do you think he's going to be classified as a corner? Or is this going to be a nickel safety guy? Like, what, what, what do you think he's going to fall? I think he should be classified as a corner. Okay. Um, but I think it just depends on where Kirby Smart plays him this year. Is he, is he going to play him back in the nickel, a lot of off coverage and stuff like that? Because if, if he is, then people are going to look at him probably – as a predominantly slot receiver, as probably predominantly a nickel. But I do think that there's some stuff he has the stuff to play outside. I just I just need to see it. And I need to see again, just like Kalen Carson, I need to see you up close and personal on these receivers. Can you disrupt their timing? Can you be patient? Which Kamari Lasseter being the bigger of the two, he does a pretty good job of that being patient with his footwork and his punches not being super aggressive. Uh but there's been like you, you talk about the, the Kalen King versus Marvin Harrison Jr. Okay, like, Marvin Harrison was giving Kamari Lasseter some work. Like, he, he was definitely getting into him. Uh, he took a, kind of spun him around a couple times. Uh, just really was able to, the, the like you said, he, an elite prospect, a top-tier type of receiver, can change your entire process as a, as a DB. And you could see, you saw that with Marvin Harrison Jr. With Kalen King, you also saw it with Kamari Lasseter. Well, Kamari was just kind of like, he didn't. He was so unsure of the tempo and speed that was coming his way from Marvin Harrison. Well, he couldn't read it correctly, and, and that put him in, in a bad spot. But I think he has the physical tools to be one of the sleepers in the class and potentially rise. Uh, but that, he's somebody that's on my radar to, to keep an eye on in 2023. Yeah, and I'm going to throw one other name out there, DP, and that's a guy – um, you talked about, I know you talked about on Locked On Clemson already, and that's, that's Nate Wiggins. And just oh, yeah. from, from the perspective of this, that we've seen, you know, Sauce Gardner be a first-round pick, right, with the length being able to run. We've seen Julius Brents be a second-round pick with the length being able to run. So the, the question is with Nate Wiggins, ball production, right, show the athleticism off, be competitive, and then are you able to guarantee your spot as a top 100 player, right? I'm not saying he's going to be a first or a second rounder, right, like, but late second early third right if you guarantee yourself a top 100 pick just based off of the trends that the nfl has you know has shown us over the over the past right that that's just the trends that they showed us these long corners that can run and they can get ball production they definitely value but dp man look man i, I think that was a fun episode right i told you 
in the in pre-show, right? I was like, I got a curveball for you. We're gonna have some conversations. Like we said, the race for cornerback one is wide open. Tier two has a chance to challenge and, and jump clearly into tier one because tier one is just a group of three guys and these sleeper corners man are going to be fun to watch and evaluate because there are some interesting products especially the guys down there in auburn man to be able to you know make some plays so dp that wraps up the cornerback episode tomorrow we're wrapping up the scouting notebook so we're we're talking safeties tomorrow then we're closing the scouting notebook getting into some nfl conversations man thank you we appreciate y'all for jumping on like shout out to y'all our everydayers not for sure, man. Go subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest episode as soon as it is available, uh, especially, you know, like I said, YouTube, but especially on the audio side, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, leave a five-star review, continue on YouTube, continue to like, subscribe, share uh, the podcast, but also hit the bell notification, guys. Hit the bell notification so you are notified whenever we drop uh, these podcasts so you can tap in with us. And, and of course, talk to us in the comments because we talk back. Like Keith said, we're getting into those safeties, man, and I think that's going to be another fun discussion that we're going to have a lot of, uh, a good time with uh, to go over ideologies, all that good stuff, height, weight, whatever. Um, in terms of Twitter, you can find Keith Sanchez at the talent code me, Damian Parson, DP underscore NFL. Uh, follow us, talk to us because we talk back. Come and join the conversation again tomorrow on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.